Gary sunk his stone-tipped spear deep into the Alpha Wolf's jugular, watching the light fade from its savage amber eyes as its broken jaws snapped shut mere inches from his face. And that, my friends, is how I escaped being eaten alive by starving wolves in the dead of winter, Gary said with a cocky grin, leaning back in his seat at the Akamarian Space Academy. The classroom of alien students sat in stunned silence, eye stalks quivering and tentacles trembling. They had thought the humans' previous stories of survival on his deadly homeworld were exaggerated, fantastical tales meant to impress. But as Gary launched into his latest batch of personal accounts, each more harrowing than the last, an unsettling realization began to take hold. Gary recounted the time he got lost while free-climbing a sheer cliff in Yosemite with no safety gear. His rope snapped halfway up the rock face, nearly sending him plummeting to his death on the jagged boulders below. Keeping his cool, Gary improvised new handholds and plotted a route to the top, racing against the fading daylight. The alien cadets gaped in shock. To them, scaling a vertical kilometer of stone with nothing but flimsy fabric ropes was unthinkable. That a human would do it for fun? Insanity. For his finale... Gary shared a pulse-pounding encounter with a lethal black mamba snake on an African safari. He described how the venomous serpent, moving faster than the eye could follow, lunged at him repeatedly, dripping fangs bared. Gary dodged the lightning-quick strikes by a hair's breadth each time before dispatching the creature with a well-aimed swing of a makeshift club. The idea of an animal evolving neurotoxins potent enough to kill a dozen Akamarians with one bite chilled the cadets to their cores. As Gary wrapped up, basking in his astonished audience's amazement, a deathly hush fell over the lecture hall. The cadets traded nervous glances, a creeping sense of unease settling in their guts. If even half of what the human said was true, had they drastically underestimated this upstart species? Craxon, in particular, felt a cold chill of dread. His military family had always scoffed at the notion of humans as a potential threat, dismissing them as soft, squishy mammals. But if they could thrive on a planet that actively tried to kill them every day. Suddenly, the newcomers didn't seem quite so harmless. What would it mean for the galaxy if humanity ever turned its tenacity and indomitable will outwards to the stars? As class ended and the cadets filed out in a daze, Craxon knew one thing for certain. The delicate balance of power that had endured for eons was about to change, and he wasn't at all sure it would be for the better. Humans were turning out to be far tougher than anyone could have imagined, and that might end up spelling disaster for every other species who called the galaxy home. The next class rolled around and the Akamarian cadets filed into the lecture hall, eyeing Gary with a mix of anticipation and trepidation. The humans swaggered up to the front, a glint in his eye. Today I've got a real treat for you all, Gary began rubbing his hands together. A tale of survival from the Amazon rainforest, one of the most hostile environments on Earth. The cadets shifted in their seats, bracing themselves. Gary launched into his story, describing how he'd gotten separated from his expedition group deep in the heart of the jungle. Alone, with nothing but a machete in his wits, he had to navigate the dense foliage and ever-present dangers. Venomous snakes hung from every branch, Gary said, voice low. Territorial jaguars stalked me from the shadows, and don't even get me started on the piranhas, razor-toothed fish that can strip a cow to bones in minutes. The cadets shuddered, imagining the horrors. But I didn't let that stop me, Gary continued. I used my knowledge of plants to find safe food and built shelters to protect myself from predators and the elements. I even fashioned a makeshift fishing rod to catch my dinner in the piranha-infested waters. Then Gary's face lit up. But that's not even the best part. Deep in the jungle, I stumbled upon ancient ruins, untouched for centuries. Of course, I had to investigate. The human's eyes took on a faraway look as he recounted exploring the crumbling structures. Suddenly, he thumped his hand on the podium, making the cadets jump. Wham! Before I knew it, I was plummeting down into an underground chamber, spikes waiting to impale me at the bottom. Thinking fast, I grabbed a vine and swung myself to safety, Indiana Jones style. 
Now the students were on the edge of their seats, clinging to Gary's every word. But it didn't end there. As I ventured deeper, I discovered a hidden treasure trove. Mounds of gold artifacts and glittering gems. I couldn't believe my luck. But then, Gary paused for dramatic effect. I heard a hiss that made my blood run cold. Turning around, I came face to face with the biggest snake I've ever seen. A massive anaconda, longer than this room and thicker than a grown man. And it looked hungry. The cadets gasped, hardly daring to breathe. What did I do? I grabbed the nearest weapon I could find, a golden spear, and prepared for battle. That snake and I danced around the chamber, its fangs narrowly missing me, my spear glancing off its thick scales. But finally, I saw my opening. Gary mimed thrusting the spear with all his strength. I drove that spear right through the beast's skull, pinning it to the ground. And that, my friends, is how I defeated the king of the Amazon. For a moment, the hall was silent. Then the cadets erupted into cheers and applause, amazement plain on their faces. Gary grinned and took a bow before reaching into his pocket. Oh, and did I mention I brought back some of that treasure as a souvenir? He held up a fist-sized, uncut emerald and a gleaming gold amulet, eliciting more gasps from the awestruck students. Craxon watched the chaos, brow furrowed in thought. The human's boldness and skill in the face of such peril was unlike anything he'd heard of. If Gary was telling the truth, and those artifacts seemed to support his claims, then Craxon's assumptions about humans had been seriously mistaken. This soft, fleshy species was proving to be made of far sterner stuff than anyone had given them credit for. As the class ended and the cadets excitedly discussed the latest revelations, Craxon felt a growing sense of unease. He caught the eye of another student who looked back at him with the same brewing apprehension. They were all coming to the same realization. Humans were not to be underestimated. And if the people of Earth ever decided to turn their tenacity and unconquerable willpower towards the stars... Craxon shuddered at the thought. The Death Worlders may be the end of us all, Craxon muttered grimly as he exited the hall. Gary's eyes sparkled as he launched into his next tale. You think the Amazon was tough? Let me tell you about the time I spent in the Arctic. The Akamarian students leaned forward, their eye stalks quivering with anticipation. Picture this, a vast expanse of white as far as the eye can see. The air so cold it freezes your breath before it leaves your mouth, and wind that cuts right through you like a knife. Gary paced back and forth, gesticulating wildly. Our research team trekked across that frozen wasteland for weeks. Every step was a battle against nature itself. And lurking out there, hidden in the endless white, were the lords of the Arctic, polar bears. He paused for effect, savoring the tension in the room. One night... It happened. A massive male, bigger than any I'd ever seen, attacked our camp. In the chaos, I got separated from the others. The alien students gasped, their tendrils writhing anxiously. I found myself alone, face to face with the biggest predator on Earth. With nowhere else to go, I dove into a nearby ice cave. All I had was my hunting knife and a makeshift torch. Gary's voice dropped to a whisper. For days, that bear laid siege to my little ice fortress. I could hear him outside, pacing, growling, waiting for me to emerge. He described his desperate efforts to survive, melting ice for water, creating crude traps from whatever he could find in the cave. I made smoke bombs out of moss and oil from my torch, fashioned spears from ice stalactites, anything to keep that monster at bay. The Akamarians listened, spellbound, as Gary recounted his ingenuity and dedication in the face of certain death. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, a blizzard hit. I knew this was my only chance. I wrapped myself in whatever scraps I could find and made a break for it. Gary's voice rose with excitement. I ran until my lungs burned and my legs screamed for mercy. But I could hear the bear behind me, giving chase through the whiteout. He described pushing his body to its absolute limits, using every trick and skill he'd learned to navigate the featureless tundra and stay ahead of the relentless predator. Just when I thought I couldn't take another step, I saw it. 
the faint glow of our base camp. I'd made it. As Gary finished his tale, the lecture hall fell silent. The Akamarian student stared at him in stunned disbelief. Craxon's eyes darted nervously. This human had now survived encounters with Earth's deadliest predators, wolves, jaguars, and now a polar bear. The implications were staggering. As the other students filed out, still buzzing about Gary's latest story, Craxon approached the human. How? Craxon asked, his voice tinged with fear. How can your kind endure such extremes, overcome such odds? Gary's lips curled into a knowing smile. Oh, my friend, he said, eyes twinkling mischievously. You haven't heard anything yet. Craxon watched Gary saunter away, a chill running down his spine. He couldn't shake the feeling that they'd grossly underestimated these Death Worlders, and he dreaded to think what other surprises humans might have in store for the galaxy. Gary's cocky grin faded as he noticed the stunned expressions on his classmates' faces. He leaned forward, his voice dropping to a hushed tone. You think the Arctic was tough? Let me tell you about the time I went spelunking in the Appalachians. The alien students leaned in, eye stalks quivering with anticipation. Picture this, pitch black darkness stretching for miles in every direction, twisting tunnels barely wide enough to squeeze through and the constant drip, drip, drip of water echoing all around you. Gary's eyes took on a faraway look as he recounted joining an elite military research team to explore uncharted caverns deep beneath the mountains. We rappelled down sheer rock faces, waded through frigid underground rivers, and squeezed through gaps so tight I could feel the stone scraping both sides of my chest with each breath. The Akamarians shuddered at the thought of such claustrophobic conditions. But that was nothing compared to what we found down there, Gary continued. As we pushed deeper into the earth, we started hearing something. At first, just faint rumbles. Then, unmistakable movement. Something big. He described the heart-stopping moment when their headlamps illuminated a massive, segmented body coiled around a stalagmite. It was like something out of prehistory. A worm as big around as a subway tunnel, with a mouth ringed with teeth the size of broadswords. The students gasped as Gary recounted how the beast awoke, enraged at their intrusion. The caverns filled with its thunderous roars as it pursued them through the maze-like tunnels. We ran for our lives, stumbling through the dark as that thing chased us. I could hear its huge body scraping against the walls, getting closer and closer. Gary's voice grew somber as he described how, one by one, his teammates fell victim to the Leviathan's insatiable hunger. Soon, it was just me, alone in the dark. My headlamp was failing, and I could hear that thing coming for me. I knew I had to do something drastic, or I'd end up as worm food, too. He detailed his desperate plan to lure the beast into a large cavern and seal it inside, depriving it of oxygen. I used the last of my light to draw its attention, then started collapsing tunnel entrances behind me. Let me tell you, trying to set explosive charges while a prehistoric monster is trying to eat you? Not easy. The Akamarians listened, spellbound, as Gary described his frantic efforts to trap the Leviathan. He barely avoided being crushed or swallowed multiple times as he worked to seal every exit. Finally, I did it. That thing was trapped, but I'd used up the last of my air. As I lost consciousness, my last thought was that at least I'd die knowing I'd stopped that monster. Gary paused dramatically. Next thing I knew, I was waking up in a hospital bed. Turns out a rescue team found me just in time following my last radio signal. As he finished his tale, the lecture hall fell silent. The Akamarian students stared at him, mandibles agape in disbelief. Craxon felt a chill run down his spine. If humans could survive encounters with such nightmarish creatures, what else might they be capable of? He exchanged worried glances with his classmates, a sense of unease growing in the pit of his stomach. Gary's eyes glinted with a feral intensity as he leaned forward, his voice dropping to a hoarse whisper. Let me tell you about Project Prometheus. The Akamarian students recoiled, their eye stalks quivering with apprehension. Craxon's tentacles curled tightly around his desk, 
knuckles paling. I volunteered, Gary continued, his gaze unfocused. They said we'd be heroes, the vanguard of human evolution. Little did we know. He described the sterile white labs, the hum of advanced machinery, the acrid smell of antiseptic. They injected us with a cocktail of nanobots and gene-altering compounds. At first, it was incredible. I could lift a truck with one hand, run faster than a cheetah. Gary's muscles tensed, veins bulging beneath his skin. But then the nightmares started, vivid, horrifying visions that bled into reality. He recounted watching his fellow soldiers succumb to uncontrollable rage. Private Jenkins tore through a steel door like it was paper. Sergeant Rodriguez crushed a man's skull with his bare hands, laughing the whole time. The classroom fell deathly silent, broken only by the sound of Gary's ragged breathing. When it hit me, it was like a tsunami of pure fury. I saw the world through a red haze. Gary's words came faster, more frantic. Cities burning, corpses piled high, blood raining from the sky. I couldn't tell what was real anymore. He clutched his head, eyes wide. And through it all, one thought kept pounding in my skull. This is what we're capable of. This is what humanity can do if pushed too far. As Gary's narrative reached its crescendo, Craxon felt a cold dread settling in his stomachs. The human before them was no longer just an oddity from a dangerous world. He was a glimpse into an abyss of potential destruction that threatened to engulf the entire galaxy. Gary slumped back in his chair, spent. The Akamarian students sat frozen, processing the horrifying implications of his tale. In the oppressive silence that followed, Craxon realized with chilling clarity that everything they thought they knew about humans had been woefully, dangerously inadequate. You have reached the end of the story. If you enjoyed this story and want to support us, please leave a like and subscribe to our channel, and for every comment that says 88, I will heart every single one of them. Thank you for your time.